I'm Janessa Jacobs and welcome to my coronavirus classroom. Today I will be finishing up the endocrine system. So let's just quickly review everything we discussed about the relationship of the hypothalamus to the pituitary. So as you recall, the hypothalamus is the master regulator of the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. And so it sits up in the brain and kind of controls everything that's going on. So we can imagine it's kind of this little region of tissue that's going up through the board here. This is the hypothalamus. And it's connected to the pituitary on the anterior side through a blood vessel network called the hypothalamohypothecal portal system. And it's connected to the pituitary on the posterior side by sending extensions of its axons down to terminate in the region we call the posterior pituitary. If you recall, the posterior pituitary releases two hormones, antidiuretic hormone or ADH, which goes to the blood and targets the kidney and causes them to uptake water. This will increase blood volume, which helps to increase blood pressure. The posterior pituitary also releases oxytocin, which is involved in normal circumstances during orgasm. Males and females release oxytocin. But then it's also involved in the positive feedback loop that helps with labor and delivery. And then it's also involved in a positive feedback loop that allows for lactation uh, to occur. So that's what's going on back there. In the anterior side, the hypothalamus is releasing release and release inhibiting hormones that are going to affect different cells in the anterior pituitary. So then the anterior pituitary will release hormones that enter the blood and affect other targets in the body. So let's just do a quick review of that. If we look first at, say, uh, the HPT axis, so the hypothalamo-pituitary thyroid axis, then the releasing hormone that's involved up here is called TRH, or the thyrotropin releasing hormone. And it's called the thyrotropin releasing hormone because it stimulates the release of a hormone called thyrotropin when it's bound to TRH receptors on cells called thyrotropes. Then thyrotropin, which is also called the thyroid stimulating hormone, is released to the blood. So TSH is the thyroid stimulating hormone. which targets follicular cells in the thyroid and causes them to release thyroid hormone. This is also called thyrotropin. Okay, another one is, let's say, the HPA axis, hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis, and the releasing hormone that gets that one going is one called CRH, or the corticotropin releasing hormone. portal system, it will enter the primary plexus, travel through portal veins, cool the secondary plexus, and bind to receptors on cells called corticotropes. So our corticotropes are the only cells in the anterior pituitary with CRH receptors, and when it's bound to the blood, they will release uh, corticotropin, or ACTH. ACTH is adrenocorticotropic hormone. also known as corticotropin. Okay, the HPG axis, how about that? The hypothalamo-pituitary gonadal axis, that starts with a releasing hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and it targets cells in the anterior pituitary called gonadotropes. They're the only ones with GnRH receptors. And when GnRH is bound, they will release two hormones, the gonadotropic hormones, FSH and LH. FSH is the follicle stimulating hormone. LH is the luteinizing hormone. They're going to enter the blood and target the gonads. I'm 
missing? Is that it? Uh, so let's think about prolactin and growth hormone. Growth hormone is released in growing individuals. It's released in low levels throughout your life, uh, but it comes from cells called somatotropes. It's really important in young people. And growth hormone actually has dual regulation. It has an inhibitor, the growth hormone inhibiting hormone, somatostatin. And then it also has a releaser, growth hormone releasing hormone. If both are bound, no growth hormone will be released. The inhibitor is more potent than the stimulator. Uh, we inhibit the inhibitor at night when melatonin comes on board. So if this is gone, then growth hormone will be released to the blood and target its tissues. Okay, so up in the hypothalamus, we've got growth hormone inhibiting hormone and growth hormone releasing hormone that are going to be able to affect this pathway. So we've got growth hormone inhibiting hormone, which is abbreviated GIH. It is the chemical somatostatin. And then we have growth hormone releasing hormone. Both combine to receptors on somatotropes.
thyroid is made of a ton of thyroid follicles all just sitting next to each other. We've cut it open in a cross section and all of these are follicular cells. Uh, if you recall about epithelial tissues, they all have a basal surface and an apical surface. The basal surface is attached to the basement membrane, so that's here. And this is where we have our thyroid stimulating hormone receptors. So if you recall, thyroid stimulating hormone is going to enter the blood and stimulate our thyroid. So here we are in the thyroid. The cells that are going to be stimulated are follicular cells. And the receptor that they have is on their basal surface. It's a TSH receptor. So the follicular cells will say respond to TSH. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Another thing to be aware of is that out here they actually have many microvilli on the surface of these follicular cells. So that's to increase the surface area. And we need to increase the surface area because thyroid hormones are actually produced out here in the colloid. Thyroid hormone is the only hormone that's produced extracellularly. And that's because um, it's really complex. But out here in this colloid we have this protein called thyroglobulin. And thyroglobulin has all the stuff that we need in it, well, most of the stuff we need in it, to make thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone synthesis also requires iodine. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is kind of a, just what is it made of? Or what does it look like and what's it, what's it composed of? So uh, thyroid, as far as thyroid hormone functions, thyroid hormone increases metabolism. It increases metabolic rate. So for the functions, it increases metabolic rate. Most cells in your body have receptors for thyroid hormone. It can be kind of hard to wrap your head around what this means, that it's important for increasing metabolic rate, unless you look at people who have hyper-functioning thyroids or hypo-functioning thyroids. Then you can see just how important thyroid hormones are. So an example that is good is there was this guy, Uncle Toby, and I think he was, I mean, he was really old. He was like in his 80s or something. And for something like 20 years, he just sat on his chair every day. And at the beginning of the day, his family would get him dressed and they'd bring him down and they'd sit in his chair and he would just sit all day long. And they'd wake him up, you know, I don't know how they fed him. I guess they'd have to wake him up and feed him some. Um, but he was just really lethargic and he didn't do much. And they just figured, oh, this is old Uncle Toby. So after about 20 years of this, uh, they took him to a doctor who tested his thyroid hormone levels and it turned out that he was super hypothyroid. He was in a hypothyroid coma. And so because of that, he just wasn't functioning. So they got him thyroid hormone, he was felt great, he was up for about happy, you know, dancing around on a little jig. About three weeks later, he died of cardiovascular issues. So you can imagine a cardiovascular system that has been sleeping for 20 years has probably uh, needs to be worked up to doing a jig or something. I don't know if he died of doing a jig. That was just my example. But, um, and then people who have like hyperthyroid conditions uh, tend to be really like skinny and like hyperactive and, and hot intolerant. And um, sometimes there's a disease, Graves' disease. They can get like bug eyes. So um, thyroid hormone really increases metabolism. Uh, as far as targets, if we wanted to think about targets, we could say most cells in the body. And so, um, like, what are things that it does? If we don't have normal thyroid hormone levels in a developing nervous system, then you'll have mental, re you can have mental retardation and impairment. So it's really important on normal developing of development of the nervous system. It's also a very important synergist with growth hormone. So when thyroid hormone and growth hormone are both bound together, as you recall, they act synergistically to make growth over and above what it would be alone. So as far as what you need to know, you could say that uh, it targets most cells in the body and the effect is to increase metabolism. Another thing that we could say is that it's really synergistic. It's synergistic with other hormones. So people who are hypothyroid tend to be low energy and cold and lethargic and put on weight. People who are hyperthyroid, hyperthyroid are the opposite. So I might be actually a little hyperthyroid myself. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. So uh, thyroid hormone synthesis. Thyroid hormone synthesis is interesting because again, it's synthesized extracellularly 
in the colloid. So I'm going to zoom in here to just one follicular cell. Imagine this is this guy right here. So I've got a little TSH receptor right here. And that's because TSH is water soluble. It's water soluble because it's a protein or a peptide. Remember, steroids only come from the gonads and the adrenal cortex. Thyroid stimulating hormone is coming from where? The anterior pituitary. So it's a protein or peptide, so it's going to bind to an extracellular receptor. And when it does that, it's going to cause a cascade of events inside the cell because we're going to start a second messenger cascade. So the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor is a G protein coupled receptor, which means that we're going to activate production of a second messenger. I'm not going to test you on all the details of this, but I want you to kind of see the magnitude of how important second messengers are, all of the stuff that they can do, and just kind of how complicated thyroid hormone synthesis is. So thyroid hormone is a modified amino acid. So what happens is we actually get these two tyrosines, Tyrosines are just amino acids, proteins are chains of amino acids, colloid is a, pro uh, is a protein rich substance full of this protein called thyroglobulin. So in this thyroglobulin we've got some tyrosines. And so we have to do lots of things in order to get thyroid hormone produced. We've got a signal the nucleus and we're going to stimulate thyroglobulin production. So we can stimulate gene transcription. We take that thyroid globulin, we make it, we ship it out to the colloid. Another thing that's going to happen is we need to release thyroid hormone. Really, that's what we want to do. When thyroid stimulating hormone binds, we really want to release thyroid hormone. So that's where we're getting. So we'll just imagine there was a synaptic vesicle, or we'll just imagine there was a storage vesicle storing thyroid hormone here, and TSH binds and they release thyroid hormone to the blood well, to do all that it does, increase metabolism in cells. But in order to even get here, we've also got to make this protein, ship it out to the colloid. I actually have to turn on this, this sodium iodine synchorter that's going to bring sodium and iodine into the cell so that I can get iodine across the cell. Then I'm going to turn on this pump called pendrin and pump the iodine out here. Then I'm going to turn on some enzymes that stick these tyrosines together. Then I'm going to turn other enzymes on that stick my, my iodines on, iodinases. And so all of those things are going to happen in response to one little TSH binding down here. So second messengers are really powerful and really important. Another thing that is true then is that thyroid hormone synthesis requires iodine. So if you live in a place where iodine is short, like the goiter belt, there's a place in the world called the goiter belt where they lack dietary iodine, and these people have really big, huge thyroid glands. And so let's just imagine. What our hypothalamus is paying attention to is how much thyroid hormone there is in the blood. So if we're low on thyroid hormone, the hypothalamus is going to say, release TRH. So TRH will stimulate thyrotropes, and the thyrotropes will say, release TSH. So TSH will enter the blood and stimulate our follicular cells, and they'll try to release thyroid hormone, but we don't have thyroid hormone because we don't have iodine. So we are, if we look here, um, what is released primarily from the thyroid is T4, or tetraiodothyronine, I think it's called. So it's got four iodines on it. That's primarily what's released. A little bit of T3 is released, and we just take off one of these um, iodines, and then it's T3, or triiodothyronine. And uh, T3 is actually the more potent thyroid hormone. Uh, there are deiodinases at the target cell that will take off that fourth iodine. But iodine is absolutely critical to thyroid hormone synthesis. So just kind of be aware of that. It's pretty interesting. As far as transport of thyroid hormone goes, this is interesting. And this is weird. This is our exception to our kind of rule about steroids versus proteins and peptides and their solubility. So most proteins and peptides are water soluble, which means they don't require a transport protein in the blood, and they have to bind to extracellular receptors just like thyroid stimulating hormone did. Thyroid hormone is amino acid derived, but because we stick all those iodines on there, it changes the solubility. So thyroid hormone actually does require a transport protein. It's called thyroid binding globulin. So when thyroid hormones are released from the thyroid, they will be bound to thyroid binding globulin, which will then take thyroid hormone to the target tissues. Target tissues have a deiodinase, kick off that fourth iodine, and then we can do all the stuff we need, which is increased metabolism. So that 
wraps up the thyroid or the HPT axis. If you recall from last semester, calcitonin puts the bone in. That is released from different cells in the thyroid. So what we looked at before was a thyroid follicle that was made of a bunch of these follicular cells. Okay, so in between all of these thyroid follicles are these other cells called parafollicular cells or C cells. So you can use either name. I like C cells because it helps me remember that they're releasing calcitonin. So my C cells are my parafollicular cells. And if we look at why they're called parafollicular cells, here's the follicle and they're near it. Para means near, follicle, these are near the follicle. These are the cells that are going to release calcitonin. So the function of calcitonin is to lower blood calcium. So calcitonin lowers blood calcium. When would we want to lower blood calcium? When blood calcium is too high. So for that, I'm actually going to have you go through some negative feedback with Chip. Welcome to Negative Feedback with Chip by Janessa Jacobs. In this edition, we'll talk about what happens when blood calcium levels increase. Good. I'm going to need you to drink this gallon of milk in the next hour. No. Wait. Why? For another edition of Negative Feedback with Chip. Yeah, but adults are hardly ever hypercalcemic. It's barely relevant. Yeah, but I want you to do the gallon challenge. No. I hear it makes you puke. It makes humans puke. Probably not angels. I'm not going to do it. Finish your lesson. Okay. Well, if you have an increase in calcium in the blood, this is sensed by C cells in the thyroid gland, also known as parafollicular cells. C cells release calcitonin, which targets effectors that lower blood calcium. And the effectors are bone, kidney, and small intestine. And what happens? You're lucky I'm nice. This is supposed to be your segment. Bone. At bone, calcitonin stimulates bone deposition by increasing osteoblast and osteocyte activity. Kidney. At kidney, calcitonin stimulates calcium excretion, causing the kidneys to pull excess calcium from the blood and concentrate it in your urine. Small intestine. At small intestine, calcitonin will inhibit calcium absorption. All of these things should help lower your blood calcium. Thank you, good. Now we're back in homeostasis. All right, so as Good mentioned, it's not very often as an adult that you're hypercalcemic. Far more often as an adult, you're hypocalcemic. And that is really not good, pretty fast. So as you recall, neurotransmission requires calcium for the release of neurotransmitters from the synapse. Calcium is also required for muscle contraction. So calcium is horribly important, and if we go too low, we're gonna have problems pretty quick. So as adults, that's commonly um, what happens. So let's look at that. Uh, our parathyroid glands are located on the posterior aspect of the thyroid, and I've heard that people can have from two to eight parathyroid glands. So it varies in number. I wish I could pop off Alex's thyroid here. I can't, um, but I don't have a model. Uh, so on the back are parathyroid glands, and they're the sensor when blood calcium goes low. They're also the control center because as long as blood calcium is low, they will be releasing parathyroid hormone. The function of parathyroid hormone is to increase blood calcium. So parathyroid glands are on the posterior of the thyroid. They're not in the thyroid, they're on the posterior aspect of, thyroid, of the thyroid, and their function is to raise blood calcium. And so, when early on in endocrine medicine, when they were doing thyroidectomies, they would take out the thyroid and think everything was going to be good, and then the patients would die like two to three weeks later, and that was because they lost their parathyroid glands and couldn't raise their blood calcium when blood calcium drop. So it's really important to be able to raise your blood calcium. And how they are going to do that 
is by targeting effectors where we have calcium stored and then effectors that we can potentially absorb calcium from. So where do we store calcium? In our bones, right? What cells are responsible, responsible for bone resorption or breaking down osteoid? Osteoclasts. So what we can do, if we think about this, if we have a drop in blood calcium, so we've got a drop in blood calcium. This is sensed by chief cells in the parathyroid glands. They're going to respond and release parathyroid hormone, which is abbreviated PTH. So the parathyroid glands are the receptor because they're sensing the drop in calcium, but they're also the control center because as long as they're sensing that drop, they will be sending out this message. So they're also the control center. And the message that they're sending out is parathyroid hormone, which is going to stimulate three effectors. So the first effector, the best effector, is where we have stored calcium. So parathyroid hormone will target bone, and it will stimulate osteoclasts. So we will increase osteoclast activity, and they will stimulate resorption. So we can say that we'll stimulate our osteoclasts, and we increase bone resorption. So what does this do? We break down osteoid, and we release this calcium to the blood. And now we've helped to raise the calcium a little bit. There are two other targets for parathyroid hormone. The next one is the kidney. So at the kidney, there's this spot called the distal convoluted tubule. We'll talk about when we get to the urinary system. And it responds to hormones. So at the kidney, parathyroid hormone is going to stimulate the reabsorption of calcium. So if you had excreted any before, and it was going to be uh, lost as urine, now the parathyroid hormone on board, we will bring it back. So this is another way that we can bring back some calcium and start coming back to homeostasis. And then the last target is the small intestine. And if you recall last semester, we talked about the sun's role in blood calcium homeostasis. What? How's the sun involved at all? And we said that the precursor to vitamin D3 synthesis exists in your skin, and the sun activates it, so it's activated with vitamin D3. That goes to your liver, gets converted to calcitriol. That goes to your kidneys, gets converted to calcitriol. Calcitriol works synergistically with parathyroid hormone at the small intestine to help increase the production of calcium transporters. So calcium is a big cation, and it's hard to absorb. So with um, parathyroid hormone present, we will um, be able to synergistically Logistically act with calcitriol to increase calcium absorption at the small intestine. So I'm going to say parathyroid hormone plus calcitriol is going to target the small intestine and increase calcium absorption. Okay, so remember the poem, calcitonin puts the bone in, parathyroid hormone does the opposite. All right, so the adrenal glands are kind of complicated, but that's okay, we got this. The adrenal glands are located on top of your kidneys in the posterior aspect of your abdominal cavity. So they're kind of sitting back here. So their location is that they are on top of your kidneys. And the divisions of the adrenal glands are that we have an outer cortex and an inner medulla. So our outer cortex is going to be that first spot that we talked about, or one of the two spots that releases steroids. So our outer cortex releases steroids. If we were to zoom in, we'd see there's a fibrous capsule on the outside of the adrenal gland. And then just deep to that, we have the zona glomerulosa. And then deep to that, we've got the thickest layer of the adrenal cortex, the zona fasciculata. Deep to that, we've got what's called the zona reticularis. And then deep to that is the adrenal medulla. So before we talk about the adrenal medulla, let's talk about each layer of the adrenal cortex. So the first layer of the adrenal cortex is called the zona glomerulosa. And it releases a category of steroids called mineralocorticoids. 
So they're corticosteroids, and they have an effect on mineral balance, specifically sodium. So in humans, our mineralocorticoid is one called, al called aldosterone. So aldosterone is our mineralocorticoid, and it's released from the zona glomerulosa. So it's uh, from zona glomerulosa. And the regulation of the secretion is twofold. It can be hormonally stimulated by angiotensin II. That's a big, long pathway we're going to talk about in just a minute. And it can be humorally stimulated by high potassium. So if you recall, potassium exiting the cell is what allows neurons and muscle cells to repolarize. So if you have a lot of potassium, too much potassium, then cells can't repolarize and you get all sorts of problems with uh, nerve and muscle functioning, and it's pretty quickly deadly. So if you go high in potassium, that alone will stimulate the zona glomerulosa to release aldosterone. And you may say, well, you just said it had something to do with sodium. It does, but sodium and potassium move opposite ways. So if you want to excrete potassium, then you can reabsorb sodium, and then we'll get rid of the potassium. So that's what we'll say for the regulation of secretion. It's a humoral due to an increase in potassium. <clears throat> due to angiotensin II. So, <clears throat> all right, what the heck does it do? Why do we care? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to target the kidney. Again, that distal convoluted tubule of the kidney. So the target is the kidney. And at the kidney, it's going to stimulate sodium reabsorption. Reabsorption. So why is it reabsorption? Well, we absorbed it one time in our small intestine, and then it was part of our blood and part of our body floating around in there. It went to our kidneys. Our kidneys filtered it out. But now we have aldosterone present, so we're going to bring it back. We're going to reabsorb sodium. Uh, with sodium goes chloride ion, and passively, water follows. So why do I tell you this? Because we're going to talk about the regulation of really, how do we get angiotensin II? And why do we want angiotensin II? What are we trying to get done? We're tr when angiotensin II is in the system, we're trying to increase blood pressure. And so one of the ways that we can increase blood pressure is by increasing blood volume. And I can increase blood volume by stimulating aldosterone release, which will stimulate sodium reabsorption, and water will passively follow. So, okay. <clears throat> Regulation of secretion is humoral due to potassium. It's hormonal due to angiotensin II. So, well, how do we get angiotensin II? Because we also said that angiotensin II is gonna stimulate antidiuretic hormone release from your, your posterior pituitary. So, how do we get angiotensin II? Well, through this big convoluted system called the renin-angiotensin system. So let's talk about the renin-angiotensin system now. So, if we have a drop in blood pressure, this is detected by baroreceptors of the kidneys. So, baroreceptors detect level of stretch. And the kidneys are going to then start pumping out this stuff called renin. Okay, so your liver does about a million things, actually about 200, but it's sitting in your uh, <coughs> abdominal cavity and it's always pumping out what's called renin substrate, RS, that's one name for it, or I like this one better, angiotensinogen. Why do I like that? Because anytime you have an ogen, this thing is an enzyme that's going to ogenerate what's in, at whatever's in front of it. So angiotensinogen will help us with the generation of angiotensin. We're trying to get to angiotensin 2, so we must start with angiotensin 1, and <clears throat> that's what happens when renin enters. 
of the system. So, renin substrate, or angiotensinogen, is always being pumped out by the liver. And as soon as this blood pressure drops and the kidneys release renin, it's going to enter the blood and combine with renin substrate to become angiotensin 1. This is high in venous blood. In venous blood, which means this is deoxygenated blood. Where is deoxygenated blood going? It's going back to the heart to get pumped to the pulmonary circuit. So it's going through the lungs. Well, guess what's in the lungs? The angiotensin converting enzyme. So right now we have angiotensin 1. This is going to go into the heart up, and get pumped out to the pulmonary circuit. So angiotensin 1 goes to the lungs. And the lungs have this enzyme called ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme. And what's it going to do? It's going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Okay, so now we have angiotensin 2 in high concentration in the blood. And this has now come back to the systemic circuit. So where's that blood entering? Arteries. So one of the things that angiotensin can do, angiotensin 2 can do, is constrict our arteries and that will help to increase blood pressure. So if you've got more blood because we've got more um, antidiuretic hormone being released, stimulating water reuptake, we've got more aldosterone being released, stimulating sodium up reuptake and water's going to follow that. We've got more blood flowing through thinner blood vessels, then that's going to increase blood pressure. So that's one of the things angiotensin 2 is going to do. The other thing that it's going to do is it's going to stimulate ADH release and it's going to stimulate aldosterone release. So angiotensin 2 enters the blood and its targets, we could say, are the hypothalamus, where it will stimulate ADH release from the posterior pituitary. Uh, angiotensin 2 is going to hormonally target the zona glomerulosa and stimulate aldosterone release. Now aldosterone is the mineralocorticoid we're talking about. Aldosterone is going to go to the kidneys, stimulate sodium reuptake, um, and angiotensin 2. I guess this is for your back pocket for now. You haven't learned about the cardiovascular system yet. Soon, you will. So this will also stimulate uh, vasoconstriction. And all of these things are going to help to raise the blood pressure. So now I've got an increase in blood volume, and I've got more blood flowing through uh, thinner blood or smaller diameter blood vessels. These two things will help to increase my blood pressure and hopefully bring me back to homeostasis. Okay. So that's the zona glomerulosa. Next we have the zona fasciculata. This is the part that is responsible for the HPA axis that we talked about last class, the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis. So that axis is in control of the release of another corticosteroid, a glucocorticoid called cortisol. In us it's called cortisol. And this is our stress hormone. So it's actually good to have cortisol. We have it, we have normal physiological or diurnal about the day pulse around breakfast time and around lunch time. So it's normal to have cortisol, but we in our 24 hour society, like seven days a week, have hijacked this system and we're always running on stress, high stress levels. So um, stress isn't super good like these days, but it is adaptive, so it's necessary. So the, our glucocorticoid, cortisol, is coming from the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex, and the regulation of its secretion is hormonal due to, does anybody remember what's the hormone coming from the pituitary? because it's the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis. It's a, the adrenal corticotropic hormone, corticotropin, ACTH. So the regulation of cortisol secretion is hormonally regulated due to ACTH, the adrenal corticotropic hormone. And when ACTH 
spines to cells in the zona fasciculata, they will release cortisol. And what does cortisol do? The action, the overall effect of cortisol is to increase blood glucose. You might say, well, why would I want to increase blood glucose when I'm stressed out? Well, you need to be able to think your way out of the stressful situation, or maybe even fight your way out of the stressful situation. You're going to need blood glucose. If you're stressed, your brain needs that glucose. If you recall from last semester, your brain is a huge sucker of glucose. Neurons are highly metabolically active and they really want glucose. So the overall goal of cortisol is to increase blood glucose in your body. And it's going to do this through several targets. So if you also recall, your liver is always storing glucose in the form of glycogen. So we can stimulate the breakdown of that glycogen, but then we can also stimulate the breakdown of other macromolecule types so that then the liver can use those to make new glucose through gluconeogenesis. So the other types of biological macromolecules we can use for gluconeogenesis are uh, proteins and fats. So this is what's dangerous about cortisol. If you have like cortisol release at first, the first and easiest target for gluconeogenesis is going to be skeletal muscle. So you'll break down your skeletal muscle so that those amino acids can be released to the blood. The liver then will pick up those amino acids and do gluconeogenesis to make more glucose. Uh, after a while, your body's going to figure out, oh, we're still stressed out. I better not continue breaking down skeletal muscle. And it will convert uh, and start breaking down fat. So then we'll use non-esterified fatty acids. The liver will use those for gluconeogenesis. So the actions are to increase blood glucose. The targets will say first the liver, then we'll say skeletal muscle and fat, but really every cell in your body has protein in it. So at the end of the day, every cell in your body could potentially res respond to cortisol. So um, each receptor at different tissues has different affinity for it. So usually, you know, the skin uh, isn't going to be affected until you're really, really uh, high stress level for a really long time, but there's also genetic variation in that. So yeah, that's our actions is to increase blood glucose. So we'll say the targets <clears throat> are almost every cell has receptors for it, but the ones that we're going to talk about are the liver, our skeletal muscle, and adipose. And what are the effects? At the liver, we will stimulate glycogenolysis so that the liver can break down that stored glucose. So glycogenolysis, oh, I'm going to lyse glycogen, which is my stored gly glucose. Uh, so that will release stored glucose. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to stimulate gluconeogenesis. And if we look at this word, Genesis means to make, what am I making? Something new, new glucose using non-carbohydrate substrates. Those non-carbohydrate substrates are amino acids from skeletal muscle. So here what, what we would say is that the process that we're stimulating in skeletal muscle is protein catabolism or protein breakdown. So cortisol at skeletal muscle is going to stimulate protein catabolism. And again, when that happens, we'll release amino acids to the blood that can go to the liver, and the liver can make new glucose. After a little bit, we're going to convert to breaking down adipose. So at our adipocytes, we would stimulate lipolysis. And then we would release our non-esterified fatty acids that the, the liver can use for gluconeogenesis. So that's that. <clears throat> The innermost layer of the adrenal cortex is called the zona reticularis. And it's not horribly important in adults. Uh, it is really important in developing fetuses. So, and that's because it releases androgens called gonadocorticoids. And androgens are necessary for normal development of the male reproductive system. But then androgens also get converted to estrogens that are not necessary for uh, normal female development. So it's really actually very important when you're developing fetus to have a functioning zona reticularis, but for adults it's not quite so such a big deal. And that's because males, uh, male adults, are making testosterone and females are making estrogen and progesterone instead. So um, it's just, we're just going to 
really kind of put it in our back pocket about the zona reticularis and let you worry about it in some other future class someday if you need it. So the innermost layer of the adrenal cortex is the zona reticularis. And it releases these two gonadocorticoids. So corticoids, it's a corticosteroid that stimulates the gonad. They're adrenal androgens. And they're DHEA and DHEAS, the sulfated version. It's like dihydroxyestroidine de lion. I'm not a chemist. Uh, yeah, so mm, what do I want you to know about it? There are adrenal androgens. So androgens stimulate aggression and libido, sex drive. So males have plenty of that because of testosterone. It's thought that maybe female sex drive or female libido is driven by uh, gonadocorticoids. So if you want to give me a function, we could do that. Another way to think about this adrenal cortex is to kind of break it out into its layers. So let's think about this whole adrenal gland, and the innermost part is the medulla. So we met the medulla last semester when we talked about the sympathetic nervous system. And so the sympathetic nervous system will directly stimulate the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. So I'm drawing you this cross section here. Our cortex is above. And if we look at our layers, the top layer, there's actually a connective tissue capsule on the outside. And then the first layer, the zona uh, lamerulosa, the cells there, I always say, kind of look globby. So my zona lamerulosa, if I'm looking at the stimulus, stimulus, here's my layer, my zone, and here's my product. Then I can also think of maybe my uh, target and effect. Then this can be a kind of a good way to graphically organize all of the things that are coming from the adrenal glands. So the zona glomerulosa is producing aldosterone. The target is the kidney. And the effect is to stimulate sodium reabsorption. That's all I'm going to write. I'm expecting you to know that what follows sodium is chloride ion and water. So the stimulus for getting that is either going to be high potassium or angiotensin 2. Okay. <clears throat> My biggest layer is the zona fasciculata. And it always looks really stringy to me. So you'll see the cells, and there are, there are visible like pink lines of basement membrane that you can see in the zona fasciculata. This is the layer that is releasing cortisol. Its target, we could say, are all cells, but specifically we could say liver, muscle, and adipose. And then again, the effect is to stimulate glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis at the liver, at the muscle we're stimulating catabolism, and at adipose we're stimulating lipolysis. Okay, what is stimulating the zona fasciculata is ACTH. Okay, <clears throat> then the thinnest layer of my adrenal cortex is my zona reticularis. The cells here look stringy and globby to me, honestly. It's like a mixture of the other two layers, zona reticularis. These release DHEA and DHEAS. What do androgens do? They increase libido and they increase aggression. Okay. Now, ACTH is coming from the anterior pituitary in response to stress. So when you're stressed out, your hypothalamus is going to be releasing CRH, the corticotropin releasing hormone. And that's going to be stimulating your corticotropes to release ACTH. Now ACTH is going to stimulate the release of cortisol. 
Okay, so imagine, if you are now, now we're down here in the medulla. If you look at the medulla, the cells in the medulla are really cellular, they're called chromaffin cells, and they're just like all squashed together. You can see a lot of blood vessels in the medulla. And <clears throat> what the medulla is doing is releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. What are they doing? They're synergizing or increasing the responsiveness of all of our SNS targets. So <clears throat> I'm in a fight or flight situation. So the neurotransmitter norepinephrine is already stimulating an increase in heart rate, it's in increase in force of contraction, increase in bronchodilation, increase in respiration. I'm in fighting and fleeing mode. And so I'm already doing all of that. So if I'm in that mode, do you think I'm stressed? Absolutely. So if I'm doing all of those things, I'm going to need the glucose to power all of that activity. So my stress hormone cortisol is going to increase my blood glucose so that I can do all of that. So that's pretty awesome. Um, why, why am I telling you this? Well, if I'm in a fight or flight situation, I'm also going to need more blood pressure. I might also need some aggression. So the thing about it is that ACTH can also stimulate the zona glomerulosa to release aldosterone. ACTH can also stimulate the zona reticularis to release adrenal androgens. So when you're stressed enough, you can get all of these things happening, which is going to also be able to help you fight or flee your way out of this situation. So as far as if we're thinking about the stimulus for release, What's happening is our sympathetic nervous system is being activated, and remember, this is when we only have a preganglionic neuron that's not going through a sympathetic ganglion. It directly synapses onto the adrenal medulla. Those are cholinergic neurons that are binding the nicotinic receptors and stimulating epinephrine and norepinephrine to be released to the blood. All right, so the pineal gland is part of your epithalamus, which is part of your diencephalon, and it's in charge of your circadian rhythms. So what's really cool is that in all animals, whether they're nocturnal or diurnal, like us, when the sun starts going down, melatonin secretion starts going up. So what time of day you sleep determines kind of its effects in you. But for us, we sleep at night. So what happens is, is that as there's a decrease in light and the sun is going down, this is going to stimulate pinealocytes to start releasing melatonin. And what is melatonin going to do? It's going to increase your overall sleepiness and help you get ready for bed. The other thing that it's going to do is it's going to, if you recall, it's going to inhibit our growth hormone inhibiting hormone um, cells so that when kids are sleeping at night, when their growth hormone inhibiting hormone gets inhibited, so growth hormone releasing hormone can enter the hypothalamo hypophyseal uh, portal system and pull around somatotropes and stimulate growth hormone release. So the pineal gland is secreting melatonin, which for us helps to increase sleepiness, but it's really important for kids because it helps with their normal growth. Okay? As far as, yes? I don't like to go to sleep when it's dark outside. You don't like to go to sleep when it's dark outside, but that's when you release melatonin, so you can grow, don't you see? As we move throughout the semester, hormones are released all over the place. So the pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine functions. The exocrine pancreas releases pancreatic juice into the small intestine, which is going to help with uh, digestion. But the endocrine pancreas is going to release insulin and glucagon that are important in blood glucose homeostasis. So, the endocrine pancreas. If you, when you're working on your lab, you'll see that the pancreas has two cell types. The exocrine types are these acinar cells that are collected around a duct because exocrine glands release their product into a duct. So you'll have all of these small groups of big cells collected around the duct. Those are acinar cells, and you might have to identify them on the left. But what we really care about are the other cells you see that are found in what are called pancreatic islets, or they used to be called islets of Langerhans. And those are just like big groups of small cells that are all 
crammed around together. And there are lots of different cell types in here. Well, I think only four. Uh, but the ones that we care about are the alpha cells and the beta cells, because those are the ones that are going to release glucose on insulin. And how are you going to remember which releases what? Alpha cells release glucagon. So we've got alpha cells and beta cells that are going to be important in blood glucose regulation. And alpha cells are the ones that are releasing glucagon. So in our pancreatic islets, we have alpha cells. And you're not going to be able to tell alpha cells from beta cells, uh, but they are both there. So if you were to walk up to a lab practical station or on your computer <laughs> and have a pointer pointing at a pancreatic islet, I could say, what's that structure? What cell types are present? What do they release? You'd say that's a pancreatic islet. The cell types are alpha cells and beta cells. Alpha cells release glucagon and beta cells release insulin. So, well, which is doing what? For which part of blood glucose homeostasis? Well, when your blood glucose levels go down, so between meals or something, that's when your alpha cells are going to respond and release our um, glucagon. So Chip here will tell us all about it. That if you get a drop in blood glucose, this is sensed by our alpha cells in the pancreas. And they're going to respond and release glucagon. So what we're trying to do is increase blood glucose. So we're going to go to targets that we can do that. Where our stored, gluco glu our stored glucose is in the liver. So at the liver, glucagon is going to stimulate glycogenolysis. <laughs> which is the breakdown of glycogen. So we'll break down our stored glucose, which will help to bring us back to homeostasis. Uh, that's gonna probably be the biggest target. You should get hungry then and go get something to eat, which will help bring you back to homeostasis. As far as the opposite side of that negative feedback loop goes, what happens when you have an increase in blood glucose? I'm gonna let Chip tell you about that. Welcome to Negative Feedback with Chip by Janessa Jacobs. In this edition, we'll talk about what happens when blood glucose levels go high in an islet party with the beta cells. Hey good, want a cookie? Heck yes, thanks! Wait, what's the catch? I need your help with negative feedback with Chip again. Okay, but it's for the students, not you. Just eat the cookie, that's what she said. What is happening in Good's body is getting her ready for this increase in blood glucose. Beta cells in her pancreas will detect this increase and release insulin. Do you know some specific targets? Nom, 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 mm-hmm. Disgusting. The liver will take excess glucose and store it as glycogen in a process known as glycogenesis. Skeletal muscle can do this as well. Neurons in your brain really love it. And all cells can use glucose for aerobic respiration. Glucose plus oxygen equals ATP, baby. So by stimulating effectors to uptake glucose, insulin will lower blood glucose and return good to homeostasis. As far as you'll see, there are other endocrine organs that we'll talk about in the gonads, the ovaries and the testes. The ovaries produce progesterone and estrogen, and the testes produce testosterone. But what you'll see is that there are tissues all over the body that release hormones. So adipose tissue uh, can release uh, hormones. It's actually thought that the signal that starts um, the GnRH surge cycle in females developing is this hormone leptin that comes from fat. So adipose releases it. You have some hormones produced in your gastrointestinal tract. Your heart releases one called atrial natriuretic peptide when blood pressure goes up. We'll talk about that. Your kidneys release renin that we just saw. That's not really a hormone. It gets, it's part of a hormonal pathway. Uh, it does release another hormone called erythropoietin that helps with blood cell synthesis, red blood cell synthesis, your skeleton, your skin, your thymus. So hormones are released all over the place, and we'll talk about them as we need to. This has been the endocrine system in my coronavirus classroom. Thank you. Have a great day.